Okay, so thank you everybody for coming. Um, and I, I want to thank the school, as you said, for uh, uh, putting this together. I'm super thrilled to uh, be able to introduce uh, Timotheus Vermeulen and uh, Robin Vandenacker. So today, uh, myself and Sarah Dunn will be having a conversation with the two of them on uh, metamodernism. And I think I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a little introduction as to why it is uh, that I, I became so interested in your work and how it is that you know, uh, we got here. So the title of this, uh, this discussion is uh, Between Irony and Sincerity. So irony in its broadest sense is a rhetorical device, a uh, literary technique or event in which what appears on the surface to be the case differs radically from what is actually happening. Irony is the expression of one's meaning by using language that normally signifies the opposite, typically um, for hero humorous or emphatic effects. Uh, at the core of post the postmodern project, irony was an important device to architecture. Uh, how something is said to accentuate a sense of skepticism uh, became almost more important than what is being said. Uh, postmodernism at the height uh, during the, the, the 1980s um, uh, was a sparkling cocktail of a couple of the, both the full awareness of the effectiveness of the argument using the tools of the academy combined with the, uh, the ability to divorce meaning from message. So here uh, to your left, you're looking at the, the 1909 theorem it was made famous by Ren Kohas uh, in the 1978 publication in Delirious New York. Uh, the cartoon Skyscraper by artist A.B. Walker was originally, pu originally published in the March issue of Life magazine that year in 1909 under the theme uh, The Real Estate Number. When this piece was published, uh, there was a naive dream about what the skyscraper is and how the skyscraper worked uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, and I think what is being represented here is represented through an absolute sense of sincerity. Uh, a stack of suburban plots uh, and with an exponential increase in property value. To your right, you're seeing the section elevation for the, the high rise of homes by James Wines. Here, Wines probably not only was aware of the 1909 theorem, uh, the way that Kohlhaas used this image, and maybe even aware of uh, the, how, how uh, to use this project to signify the opposite uh, as a rhetorical device, uh, an ironic project. So still to your left is the high-rise of home project from James Wines. So I want to maybe compare these two uh, as opposed to you know, the first juxtaposition um, where you have a sincere project versus an ironic project. But once again, you have an ironic project versus a sincere but ironic project. Uh, so the rolling house is from uh, Andres Hake. And the way that I've always uh, regarded the Rolling House project is it's spoken through the voice of irony uh, with the intention of sincerity, uh, which is uh, vastly different, I think, from the inten intentions of uh, the work of James Wines. So today we're joined uh, by Sarah Dunn. Uh, Sarah Dunn and I uh, were, I guess, first-hand witness of a what I would call a movement in Chicago uh, led by Mr. <coughs> Bonsomo. And I think uh, during that time, there was a re-examination of the values of postmodernism uh, with or without the visual qualities of postmodernism. I think it remains a project largely that largely deals with the communi communicative, pro uh, com communicative um, quality of architecture uh, as architecture behaves as an extension of the human body to communicate on behalf of humans. And so, if we think about architecture and its relationship with communication, uh, I think it, naturally it evolved into certain shapes or forms or certain graphics, uh, and maybe even the ways that we used to understand ducts and decorated sheds uh, had to have been re-examined too. Uh, it was also during this period that uh, Sarah and I witnessed uh, the making and the coming together of, uh, of this AD issue, Radical Postmodernism. It's, if you are familiar with uh, this text to your right, I think, uh, if you're not familiar with it, I recommend a quick read of it. Uh, this, this was written by Sam Jacob, uh, uh, famously, uh, and how to become 
famous architect here, uh, Sam Jacobs, saying, go dig up magazines that are roughly 15 years old, uh, specifically look for things that are not fashionable anymore, uh, do that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, let's not forget it was not that long ago uh, when doing postmodern projects are not only not fashionable, uh, but kind of embarrassing. Uh, but we somehow develop the capacity to not only entertain the values of postmodern project again, but we look at that period with a new feeling. So something is changing. I, I have to I have to say, you know, as a practitioner, as a person who's in this world of architecture, uh, something has has been changing over the last ten years, and uh, we do now have this ability to uh, embrace the the sensibilities of. Um, what what might look and sound like postmodernism, but I believe underneath it all, there's a sincere project. And so these are some of the Chicago moments, I think, between Sarah and I. But I think, you know, uh, outside of the United States, even, so there's Constantinos, uh, he's responsible for the image to the left from Point Supreme. And even within Europe, I think uh, the idea of referencing something to create a feeling uh, is not necessarily uh, regarded as a postmodern project per se, but more, uh, it's either a um, standpoint project or, or maybe even um, a sensational project, uh, almost the way that you, you would uh, quote another guitarist when you're playing a solo. And I think, you know, between art and architecture, uh, the, 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 the feeling of uh, doing something funny or ironic uh, here, I think, you know, especially in the case of First Office, uh, one of the most frustratingly ironic uh, groups that I've ever, I've ever encountered, um, everything they do is through a wink and, and a, a, with their tongue on their cheek. And at the same time, it's uh, fully aware and uh, maintaining a naive position uh, for, some, for some reason. So times are changing, and, you know, is it postmodernism? Is it not postmodernism? Uh, are we here in a school? Even the dean uh, participate, participates in, in this project. Um, and if it's not postmodernism, what is it that we're doing? Uh, I think architecture is a self-reflective field, uh, first, first and foremost. And I think you know, as one of the most par powerful documentation devices to humanity, uh, the time span of our contribution is a marker that sends messages about our way of life deep into the distant future just the same way that we can still understand uh, this in the past by studying, uh, you know, archaeological architecture. So, in today's political landscape, I think the stability uh, that upon which relativism and absolutism used to sit on is suddenly uh, not only very fragile, but on the verge of collapse today. And I think, you know, especially into this post-2016 world, the oscillation between irony and sincerity is ever increasingly in, in, uh, increasing its intensity. So uh, during one of my late night YouTube deep dives, I discovered a clip called The Philosophy of Shia LaBeouf, uh, which I, I don't know if you guys, have you guys watched it? I have. Yeah. Um, did they do an okay job? Not for us to comment upon, but we did it together with students at Goldsmith. <laughs> yeah, some say it, I guess. Yeah. Um, so th this guy, Jared Bauer from the channel Wisecrack, uh, I think did a, a, uh, opened the door for me to kind of discover you guys, uh, the metamodernist uh, group. And so as he described, an obscure philosophy group in the Netherlands. And <laughs> <laughs> I took the bait and followed this rabbit hole. And uh, it was really fascinating. So here we are today, uh, like Tim and Robin. I think I'm a product of the late 20th century, uh, with, a many, with many of my coming of age moments uh, circulated around Seinfeld, Simpsons, and South Park. I think where I learned to speak about topics that may inspire a degree of skepticism or some uh, desire for intellectual scrutiny, only, I can only speak it with a voice of irony. I don't know how, to, how else to speak it. Uh, because that is, that is almost my uh, natural tongue in some ways. It's almost like a reflex or a sneeze. Uh, it's, it's almost like a Tourette's. I, if I see something critical, I will sound, sound ironic with or without being ironic. Uh, but underneath neat at all, I would be a person that would subscribe to a sincere project. So for example, you know, um, I, I, I very much identify with one of the uh, sayings that, that uh, a person who practices uh, stoicism may say, which is, 
for every human connection you make, every relationship should be an end in itself, never a means. Which I find, you know, like if that's the type of sincere project that we, we or the sincere the feeling that we have about people these days, um, I think uh, it's, you know, architecture is uh, hopefully part of that. And architecture, I think it's always slightly late to the game, as, as I was mentioning to Jim and Robin. And, and if we re-examine the way that we engage in various uh, moments in art and philosophy and literature, we are always a little bit late. It might be because architecture takes a while to build. It might be because architects, a lot of times, only talk to each other. Um, but it, I think it's an exciting moment to have the two of them. Uh, we are able to chat with them today. So, uh, Vern Newland is an associate professor at the University in Oslo. Uh, he teaches in media, culture, and society. His, re his research interests include cultural theory, in particular post postmodernism, metamodernism, as well as contemporary aesthetics, both across art media and arts and films and television. And his main focus now lies on the scene, and spatially and in the nature of fiction. Robin van der Hocker is a doctoral researcher at the uh, guest, re sorry, guest researcher at um, um, Erasmus University. No. no. This is a very old bio, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, may maybe they can uh, introduce themselves. But, uh, you know, it's always been a dream of mine to be able to do this, uh, you know, to engage in uh, living and working philosophers. And uh, without further ado, uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, so, so what we thought, so, I'm Tim, this is, this is Robin, we are these obscure philosophers, uh, <laughs> and we are, I think, quite obscure. Um, we've been working, just, you know, from the outset, we've been working on metamodernism as a project, as an attempt to find a vernacular for a series of developments that we saw happening across culture, especially culture in the West, which is where we are based, right? So it would be disingenuous for us to make claims beyond that, because you know, we lived in Holland, when, or in London, where we started, and in Holland, and in Germany and France, and so, you know, we're speaking about that, above all. But so, we've been working on this for 10 years. The attempt to find a vernacular, to find a language that may help us understand a lot of these, at once similar, overlapping, and yet distinct developments have been popping up since the mid-90s early 2000s, and then especially after the financial crisis from 2008. Ten years, initially with the two of us, then increasingly with more and more people. For a while we, uh, we had a blog, which is really inactive now, and then I think had over 60 contributors, so it's, it's a big project. We're going to talk about it for 20 minutes, which obviously is going to leave a lot behind. Uh, it may also be good, I don't know if we have more depth than uh, 20 minutes, but it will leave some stuff behind. Just to, we saw the Shia Leboeuf uh, picture, just to say, we are writing about Shia Leboeuf, which is not to say that we're not fascinated by what's happening, but we started this as, a, as an, an analytical project. We have particular political claims, but we started this as, a, as an analytical project. And then one of our contributors, Luke Turner, started working along those lines with, amongst other, Shia to do the project. So where, where are we? Just, I think it's important we come before <laughs> and not after. <laughs> um, the important thing is that we're not pushing an agenda, right? That's the, that's the key. No agendas, no agendas. Well, <coughs> yeah, I, I guess. So, <laughs> this, this will happen or not. <laughs> like a lot of <laughs> This is what we want to start with. And so, when we started writing in 2007, 2008, we noticed um, that especially across the arts, the very different disciplines, so fine arts and galleries and to the lesser extent museums, in film and literature, something was changing. And it's something, I guess, many different forms and many different shapes and many different implications. But one of the key things that was changing was what you might call a sentiment, an attitude, a tone. We noticed that our students uh, were no longer reading as we were in the 90s. Bradley Stanellis or Michel Wolbeck or Evelyn Jelinek or Barth or you know, any of those sort of writers. Copland, they were starting to write very, to read very different writers like Foster Wallace and Zadie Smith and uh, Franzen and Jennifer Egan and Bolaño and so on and so forth. Right? So a very different group of people. The same was happening in film. 
where the so-called smart film, which is a concept from film studies, Jeffrey Scones wrote a really good article about it, the films of the 90s, films like American Beauty and Happiness, I don't know if you recall those films, um, that were, Jeffrey Scones said, marked by a bleak attitude and indifference towards its characters, were suddenly shifted in popular culture by the, for the films by Wes Anderson, Spike Jones, Coppola, and so on. And so for a very different sentiment. And we saw this happening again and again. And so in the arts, you saw a move from the YBAs. I mean, no one takes these guys seriously anymore, I think. Right? No one buys them anymore, so there's the market as well. Uh, to, in, well, and Timmy was part of this, to the Younger Than Jesus show, this was really a landmark here in, uh, in New York, at the new museum. A generational shift. Art is younger than, than, uh, than 33. You know, Jesus. And um, who? whose work was marked also by a shift the critic Jerry Stoltz wrote from a sense of irony, a sense of nihilism, a sense of apathy, to a willingness to once again engage constructively. Right? And we'll deepen some of these out uh, in a second. But so across the field, in culture, we saw a move from what could be called roughly iron an ironic uh, detachment, a deconstructed notion, right? Bradley Sinellis and the YBAs, they will say, the world is really shit, right? it's not a great place, and we should show everyone how terrible it is, but it's really difficult to think in terms of alternatives, to offer different ways in which the world could be, and so what you see is that they break stuff down, the same happens across the board. So you see the shift from ironic detachment to what we might call uh, post-ironic, or uh, a willingness to be sincere. Not the achievement, right, but the willingness to somehow engage once again with the world around, around us. And I think this is the, the, the move that we tried, that we started to try and put into words and to map out. I guess. Yeah. All right, so these, these, these changes that Tim described from uh, sort of practices that were structured around irony and practices that were structured around something which you could call post irony. Um, for us, that's why I insisted that we are not sort of pushing an agenda or writing a manifesto. For us, these are pointing ultimately to a change in culture that you do not necessarily celebrate. Um, they, do they, they, they point to a shift, as we call it, in the structural feeling. Now, this notion of structural feeling uh, is a notion by Raymond Williams, um, and it's a very slippery notion, um, but what it basically points to is a feeling, a sentiment that is so widespread that it becomes structural and that it becomes structuring, it becomes a formative moment in culture, a feeling that structures as well. Um, one of the ways of, of seeing um, this change in the structure of feeling is by first going briefly back to Jameson in his famous uh, essay based on Bruce about postmodernism, but also Harvey. They also use the notion of structural feeling, and for Jameson it was a structural feeling of the postmodern years that was related to the sense of an end. Right? And he points to all kinds of debates, he had an art, he had an ideology, he had politics, etc. But ultimately he points to that very famous ideological cipher of the sense of an end, Fukuyama's notion of the end of history. Now, for Jameson, and that is one of his most clever negative versions, I would say, the notion of the end of history is not about time at all, he says. No, it's about space. And what he means by that is that the postmodern years are marked by what he calls the blocking of the historical imagination. The fact that because of all kinds of developments, for, for instance, the sort of the, 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 the complete enveloping of the world by capital, because the, the fall of the Soviet Union, the opening of the Chinese market, that's on a global level. And on a local level, sort of the, the, the coming of age, the, 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 the enormous proliferation of consumerist logic and the logic of the commodity in everyday life. Um, what happens in everyday life is that it sort of takes place, from a Western perspective at least, in some kind of comfort zone that is highly commoditized, highly mediatized, and is only consisting of <coughs> right, sort of a comfort zone which is quite well, quite okay to be um, 
and that comfort zone sort of blocks any view, any relation to the past and the future. Now what we have seen happening in the 2000s is a change in that sense on end into a sense of something else. Um, and we have come to call this in our recent book the sense of event. I mean, that's sort of a wink both to uh, Jameson and his sense of event and to a column that uh, uh, Rakila wrote about the band of history, as you call it. Um, and this sense of a band ultimately points to that widespread feeling among, uh, across culture, that yes, history is not at all ending, maybe it has ended for us, but it has been somehow, again, kickstarted, right? Somehow, all kinds of developments have urged us to once more feel that there is something at stake and that history is once more uh, moving forward. Secondly, it points to the widespread feeling that hidden around the event is awaiting something that looks very nasty at this point. We cannot know what it will be. We only know that it will be a cluster part of the historical proportions, right? Something is coming. Um, we don't know what it will look like, but we do know for sure that the 1% will be sitting at the top of the social pyramid, the rest of us will be sitting at the base, it will be crumbled by tropical storms and rising sea levels in highly precarious conditions. Those are sort of parameters of that thing that is hidden around the vent that they were rapidly approaching. That sense of the vent um, is, of course, related to the various crises uh, that we have seen emerging in the 2000s. Um, I will not do the whole periodization thesis of the 2000s, but I think it's good to, to say um, and state that for us, the 2000s have the same historical importance for the emergence of the metronomic structural feeling as the 60s had for the emergence of the postmodern um, A shortcut into that periodization type that thesis would be, for instance, to point to the two moments of struggle that we look at the 2000s, right? In the 1990s, you get the first uh, sort of wave of alter globalist uh, struggles and protests, and in 2011, we have the Occupy movement. Now, the critical issue that would be a very sh brief shortcut to periodize. So, this metamodern uh, structural feeling is the sense of events, and that could only become dominant in the 2000s as a period. All right. Yeah, so it's related. I think it might be good to, we showed it. You know, it's, it's not Williams, and that's why we chose this notion of structural feeling. I think it's important to say he is a Marxist, but he's not Marxist in the sense that he believes that every cultural development is a consequence of material development, right? He says that these can well parallel and interfere with each other. And so I think it's the same for us. I think there's these three developments, right? There's all these crises happening, there's these technological changes, and we'll come, I guess, to, to, to Twitter maybe in, in a second. Um, and there's also a new generation, right? This, I think this begins really as a generational desire to do something else. But so it is not the case that whatever the structure of feeling is, that it emerges as a result of specific developments, but it, it seems to run parallel to them. So there will be links, but it's not one that follows after the other. Okay, this is, so there's, I think there's for us, there are five kind of tropes that we, we've seen in the arts. And so we're not really speaking about architecture simply because we don't really know anything about it. So it would seem really weird if we would start telling you stuff about it. I mean, it seems an American uh, political tradition right now to do that, but <laughs> I don't think we should, we should do the same thing. So, we'll not, we will not talk about architecture, I think we'll talk mostly about literature and contemporary art. And so, there's five sort of shifts, I think, that run parallel to this, which is a return of constructive political engagement, uh, the return of a grand narrative, but a problematic grand narrative, a grand narrative that always sort of eats itself, you could say. Uh, Post-irony, which is Lee Constantinus' uh, term, uh, which is great, and we'll come to that in a second. Effect, the return of, a, of an effective register. People speak about empathy a lot, right? Ben Lerner, Zadie Smith. Uh, and the return of a particular notion of craft. And this is a work, I don't know if you know it, we, we speak about this a lot because we love this work. Both of them actually look at the top one by Nam June Pai and the bottom one by Annabel Daou, uh, an American Lebanese artist, who might live here actually, in New York. Um, 
And these are two works which both are concerned with television, with the TV. As you can see, they are concerned in slightly different ways with televisions. The top one, which is a kind of a David Bowie lying lazy behind all those televisions, you know, becoming apathetic of all, all that has offered, the spectacles offered on the TV, maybe in Z between and so on and so forth. Uh, the Nanjing Pai work, which is fantastic, uh, is indicative for many people of a postmodern moment in contemporary art. <coughs> what I want to say a few words about now is the second one, which is the work of Bel Daou. This work, so maybe, you know, maybe I should, no, I'll start with the work. So the work is as follows, there is this, this TV set, which is a, a TV set from a different age, obviously. I doubt that many of you, unless you're like um, one of those Instagram hipsters, you know, few people will have this TV, right? I, I'm guessing. <laughs> Um, so it's an older television, an older model, and it's a static image. An image that might as well be a confession screen, but isn't much deeper. And so it's an image that mediates between inside and outside. Um, and on this television screen, there is a performance that can be heard, which is the artist asking people in galleries the question, which side are you on? And it's, I mean, every time I hear it, it's, I think it's just fascinating. So which side are you on? And people have to answer instantaneously. And so I do this with my students a lot, I won't do it here, uh, uh, like some kind of uh, shitty TED talk, but I, I do this a lot with my students where I ask the same question, which side are you on? And I expect them to answer instantly. And that's really difficult, right, to answer this question instantly, which side are you on? And it's difficult, I would guess, and I think this is part of the strength of the work, there's far more to this work than I can explain right now, but part of the strength, I think, is that it's difficult to answer that question for two reasons. The first, Oh yeah, so the answer is also that she gets, you always hear the doubt, right? So people are like, Ugh. and then they will say something, sometimes they'll say something very meaningful, I guess, or something well-intended, humanity, or this side of the Palestine-Israel conflict, or this side of, but often they all resort to a joke, you know, side of Star Wars, the sunny side, I think many people say that, uh, which is you know, not a bad joke, I think. Um, the West Side, you know, those kinds of things. But the hesitation, and I think the hesitation is there for two reasons. The first reason is that this is an open question, right? Which side are you on? I mean, it, it could really refer to any debate, right? You could say it refers to a political debate, maybe to a sports debate, sexual debate. I don't know, it could refer to everything. And so how do you choose if the playing field is open, because I could, for example, say I'm on the side of Arsenal, which is my, my favorite football team. Right? But that excludes what I imagine are far more meaningful answers. Right? But even if I would give one of those meaningful answers, they would exclude. And so it's very difficult to choose. Because if you can only choose one, then what is all the stuff that you're leaving behind? And I think the reason that is extra hard is what Lyotard is written by Jean-Francois Lyotard, one of the great chroniclers of the postmodern. And Lyotard writes about the postmodern condition as follows. He says that the, the postmodern, for him, and he writes about this in the Défaudrant, is like an archipelago, so it's like a series of islands in a sea, and the postmodern is the admiral on a ship sailing between the different islands. Right? And in the modern position, you would be on one island and you would say, this is the truth. What happens on this island is definitely and inevitably true. And so I will be willing to do anything to make the laws, the truths of this island happen. Right? This is what we get with fascism. Right? If you are willing to sacrifice everything at the cost of that one single truth that you're following, we're in a particular kind of ballgame. It's not, not a great one, I guess. And we are seeing, I guess, the emergence of a similar game across everywhere. Um, the postmodern condition for Leo Tide, the Différent, is different. You are the admiral on a ship and you are sailing between these islands and you're never setting foot on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the shores. And so you can see, oh yeah, so this is the language game that they're playing here, these are the laws that are... So you can begin to compare, without yourself taking position, how the world works. You can see these different language games, you can make sense of it. You could call them discourses, language games, whatever you want to call them. But we can see that each island has its own truth. And you'll probably find that the truth on this island is valuable, but maybe something is valuable here as well. Right? And you can easily sail between these islands. And the question I think that Annabelle Dabou poses is what do you do when you feel, whether it's correctly or not, what do you do when you feel that the ship is sinking? Or when you feel that everyone is sick, 
there's no food. Which island do you go to? And so if you're forced to choose one island out of all these islands, whilst knowing that each of them has a particular value, and that choosing, I mean, that's what Lyotard says, or beware of the white terror of truth. I mean, Lyotard is, I think, such a great philosopher because he is always afraid of people speaking the truth. Right? Which doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask and we shouldn't look for truth, but we, we should always have that moment of doubt. Right? The, the science of doubt, I guess. But so, what do you do when you choose one island? Which one do you choose? And that's an impossible question because you know that everyone, every single one of them has, has, its, has its value. And so, what I guess that will point to is that what many people seem to be doing, and this will go for the arts in, I think, very exciting ways, and in politics in, I imagine, disastrous ways, is that people, out of some sort of desperation, begin to move rapidly between these different islands. And so, you hear you think, ah, oh, and then you go somewhere else, right? And so you begin just moving desperately until, I guess, the boat is gone, right? And then you're stuck somewhere. And so you have this, this, this rapid movement, this constant repositioning. And I see, I mean, I don't know about you, but when I'm on Facebook, especially, I mean, I'm not on Twitter because it frightens the hell out of me. I'm on Facebook, which obviously now I realize it should have frightened the hell out of me. <laughs> so every time I see people discuss stuff, right, and there's something really outrageous that's happened, and everyone's like, oh, outrageous, and we should shame this person, and we should be outraged about this. And then one person will say something, and I think, yeah, that's a really good argument. And then the next uh, person says, yeah, that's actually, you know, that's also really valid. And then you, you don't really know where to, where to move in or who to agree with, because I guess that so many of these points have something. And so it is that same kind of sense of desperation, which in my very postmodern take, I guess, results in a sense of apathy or of, of, of powerlessness. But it is interesting to take this. Uh, I, there's more to say, but I think I should probably, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, let's do it. So let's go back to um, post-irony, which is one of the, 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 the core sensibilities or strategies of this sense of the plan. Um, we prefer the notion of post-irony, it's a notion that we uh, firmly borrow from Louis Constant Minou, great literary scholar, um, over the <coughs> sensibility, for instance. Um, because for us, we're always already tied to this postmodern position. As Kevin has also explained, we millennials at least have grown up on a sort of diet of, of, of irony in Seinfeld, etc. Um, so we are always tied to this ironic mode. But in the light of this sense of a band, we also feel the need to temporarily displace this irony. Because, as David Foster Wallace uh, greatly argued in the ninth zone, um, irony doesn't really seem to be the va a valid response anymore. The irony was a super powerful tool, a sword weapon, you would say, in the early postmodern years. And it helped to expose all, all kinds of hypocrisies, it helped to expose uh, all kinds of uh, uh, power structures, etc. But as David Foster uh, Wallace uh, rightly says, um, the problem is that once the rules of art are debunked, and once the unpleasant realities that I already diagnosed are reviewed and diagnosed, then what do we do? Right? So, so in high postmodernism, let's say the 90s, early 2000s maybe still, um, irony became some kind of defense mechanism rather than an assault weapon. Right? It helped you to shield yourself from the absurdities, the injustices of the world that you felt powerless to actually deal with, or um, you didn't have the need or the urge to deal with it because, hey, everything was rather swell at the end of this Right? So, irony, for instance, for uh, Nirvana, a good example, irony there is it becomes some kind of defense mechanism. You know that um, there's an awful lot of things are going to tell you wrong. You don't have the power to do something about it, so you sort of start to defend yourself with this ironic mode. Now, what we have been seeing across culture, um, especially uh, in the 2000s and, and still today, is that people therefore try to move away from this ironic disposition by temporarily sort of displacing it. And you see various strategies popping up, you see the, 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 the longing for sincerity, right? So a temporary uh, displacement of your ironic mode to engage sincerely with a certain topic or a certain 
and others or a certain problem. You also see irony coupled often to um, sort of political activism, you could say, so a constructive engagement with the world, also knowing perhaps that um, might be rather futile what you're doing, but at least I do something because I need to do, I have that urge, considering the fact that I have this sense of history bending. Um, so it has been one of the dominant tropes of us projects, you know, in the first uh, the first slide. Well, a great example of this is uh, when, you, when you compare these two works. The first one is by Richard Hamilton. Um, the title is just what it is that makes today's home so pleasant, so appealing. Um, which, in this case, is of course a highly ironic title. Because Hamilton is not saying at all that these homes are so appealing and so pleasant. No, he's of course mocking the blossoming consumer culture. It's a work from the 50s, one of the first four artworks. He's, of course, criticizing, constructing this world. He says it's ridiculous, this, 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 this consumerism, this body culture, this notion of, of, of interior decoration, right? You also see here this blocking um, um, of this sort of imagination, perfectly fine and well illustrated, right? So this is this particular moment in which you are in a completely comfortable now, but there's no sense of futurity of the future, and the past is sort of recede, receding in the background, but it's only available through some kind of mediation, right? It's also being practically the same as the past. So here you see a certain world, a world that deconstructs and criticizes the here and the now, and doesn't give you any sense of being related to a past and a future. So, a defined illustration of this sense of agency. In the second work by Richard Hamilton, which is an obvious reference to David Thorpe, uh, David Thorpe which is obviously a reference to Hamilton because of the mise en scène, the, the, the sloping lines here, uh, the technique that's used, collage as well, um, you see something else in that. Um, first of all, the materials that are used. You don't see materials from uh, Playboy magazine or some kind of uh, religious digest. Nobody uses his letter, uh, paper cutouts, um, a much more organic sort of feel, look and feel, you could say. Um, second of all, you have the title here, which is the Covenant of the Elect. And that's a very ambiguous title, because it's this sort of mocking these naive or moronic people that sort of think that they create some kind of community outside of civilization, uh, or is it actually sort of a tribute to this elect, right? So you see on here already this ambiguous relation between irony and sincerity, but also in the way this world actually functions. Now you see all kinds of reference, references to worlds or traditions that cannot possibly go together. You see references to sci-fi, you see very traditional uh, sort of uh, uh, buildings, you see reference to religion, to just Tiger Walker, to um, uh, the Far West. So, what happened, uh, David Forbes is doing here is creating a world that he takes some kind of communal idyllic life, but he does so by using the remnants and sort of the waste products of the past, of all kinds of other attempts to build worlds. And these worlds cannot possibly exist together. There's already one thing. You cannot have cowboys and Indians with science fiction. You cannot have religion and the critique of religion in one coherent universe. But still it's there. Second of all, um, what it points to is sort of this longing to start to reconstruct and sincerely engage with the notion of another world is possible. Right? But it also the complete and utter lack, even though there is this enormous sense of that, to, of a, a vocabulary, of a political language, to create such another world. So, in terms of historical imagination, you see here again an enormous longing to construct another type, another type of society, another type of community life, um, then using sort of 
the waste products of the past, of the tradition, or of the history, um, in order to create the future. But it points them in the end towards a longing, a desire, but a lack of sort of the tools and the vocabulary. Okay. How long do we have time? Should we should we call it? I don't know. It's, I could I could go on and talk about this, but we can also start having the conversation. It's, yeah. Okay. okay. So just to just to sort of you know to finish. So this is just a, a snapshot, I would guess, right? So. What I'm hoping already is becoming obvious that we are talking about just what we call the structure thing, the sensibility. Uh, Noel Carroll, the philosopher, would say a mood. Right? And in the same way that when you wake up and you're feeling a bit, uh, I don't know, you've eaten too much the night before, or too little, or you haven't done enough sports, or too much, your stomach is telling you something, and your mood will inflect everything on the day. Right? And so if uh, you have a person who's unfriendly to you, and you're in a good mood, maybe you'll just say, oh, it's all right. But if you wake up in a wonderful, uh, in a terrible mood, and that person is unfriendly, obviously you won't. But also then, if a person is friendly, you will still see that through a negative lens, right? So it's this mood, this sensibility that inflects everything. And I think what we're seeing here is a, sh is a shift in that sensibility, a shift in your mood, in the mood of your body. You could say it's a, a different way in which your body feels out the world and engages with the world around you. And that is a shift from this, this ironic detachment, which is a contract between the speaker and the listener to a more willfully sincere uh, um, sensibility, which is also a contract between a speaker and a listener. And I think if this irony is key, this is an irony of, of knowing that the position at hand may be untenable, but that the future is as well, that you nonetheless make the move. Right? So like Annabel Daoud does, or indeed like David Thorpe does. One of the models from the 70s, a famous Dutch, uh, Dutch artist, Bas Nader, would do the following, he would hang from it, you might know it, he would hang from a branch in a tree, and then he would let loose. And the premise was that for a moment he would believe that he could defy gravity, which of course he couldn't, and he would break his arm. But right, it's that moment. For a moment you will yourself to believe that something is happening, but only within the, the framework, you might say, of that performance. And so, this shift, this sensibility shift, from irony to sincerity, may be, and I think this is what we're beginning to work on a lot right now also, and we'll, we'll do a little thing for you folks tomorrow about this as well, is a shift from what you could call the what-if, or the risk society, as Ulrich Beck says, to the as-if, which is the modality of fiction, which is the modality of postulation. Right? And so the what-if is the modality of the algorithm, right? So, or the, uh, the insurance company, right? And so you say, I'm standing here now, what are all the conceivable routes to me dying? Right? That's what an insurance company does. They sort of say, okay, you could die like this, and like this, and this. And on the basis of that, that calculation of what could happen, you know, we'll, we'll decide how much you have to pay us right, to insure you. <coughs> this is a very, I mean, Shell does the same with oil, right? I mean, this is the model of the 90s and, and to an extent of the present. The as if is a different model. It doesn't say what would we do if that happens or what would we do if it, no, it says, let's just pretend that this is the scenario. I mean, this is of course what Donald Trump is doing, right? He's constantly creating as if, as if. So it's the modality of the, the comparative modality, the as with the if, the conditional. So you're always already comparing something with something that is not real at that moment. So you're postulating, you're not questioning, you're postulating something. Let's see, let's pretend this is a, a teacup. Right? So let's pretend that we are all monkeys. And then we behave upon that premise, on that fictional premise. And so this is a very different one. And I guess this is a disaster zone, and also where um, we see in the arts that the imagination is returning. Right? If this notion of this vacuum of history, this end of history, is about the emptying out of the historical imagination, we can no longer think in terms of the alternative, we don't know where to look for, how to look beyond what we have at hand, then fiction may also well be that alternative. Right? You have to postulate something and then behave or move after that postulation. And so this is the, the modality in a sense. This is by Guido van der Werve. It's a wonderful piece. It's a Dutch artist. Uh, you know, well, I, I, I didn't contribute to the piece, so there's no reason for me to be proud of it just because I'm also from Holland. No, I'm not showing it. We don't have time. We don't show it? No, no. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly tell you. So what we see is a little dude, uh, you know, this is this guy. Uh, Terrible. I think it's the artist, he looks very tiny from here, in front of a humongous icebreaker, right? 
And so this little man is walking, I mean, he's enormous as well, he looks little, little to us, and so he's walking up. Ah. Okay, we are showing it. Thank you, guys. So just, I think one second will be enough. Or one second will be enough. No, ten seconds maybe. No, no, this is good. Yeah. Right here? Yeah. yeah. So this goes on, right? This, this is looped. And so what we have is an icebreaker who is literally breaking the feet, uh, breaking the ground under this dude's feet. And yet, this person remains walking steadily towards us, calmly. He doesn't waver, he doesn't move about, he remains walking towards us, the camera, which is at the non place, I guess, towards us. It starts with this wonderful, everything will be all right. If this was a Tarantino film, we know what would happen, right? The person would die, instantly, or like get told so long to something. But everything will be all right, boom, person dead. And all of us will be like, oh, that's a good joke, man. Yeah, it would be a good joke, I guess. Um, but here, this person keeps walking and nothing happens. And it's looped, and it's looped, and it's looped. We don't know where the person is walking, but we know that the person is keeping faith somehow into something. He keeps continuing the path, path, and go on and go on and go on. And the icebreaker doesn't come close, it stays at the same distance throughout. This person isn't wondering what if, this person is wondering, is, is imagining something. Is imagine that things will be alright, that things will be okay, even though all the evidence points to the contrary. Right? I think if we would keep this going on forever, eventually something bad must happen. But this is the notion. You postulate a fiction that you don't really know how it looks. So it's if you've been locked into a room forever, and you don't know if there is an outside, and that if there is one, you don't know how it looks. And so you paint a little window on the wall. And you have to pretend that this is how it looks. And you begin behaving according to that window. Right? So sorry, we should really go. <clears throat> yeah, super sorry about that. Oh, don't, don't uh, it's a really good piece, actually. It's a fantastic piece. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we can freeze frame and. Uh, yeah? Yeah. Begin the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Where do we sit? I'm sitting here. Should we sit in the film? The, 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 oh, this is going to be cross examination. Well, so. Fantastic, and I wish. What was the last? Was there one more slide? Or yeah, yeah. one more slide, which is uh, uh, yeah. grotesque uh, oversimplification so, yeah. of the world. The scheme of, of what our present looks like. Oh, yeah. Let's, let's just, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's um, a bit embarrassing, but this is it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I. Um, I have like a really, uh, I have a couple of my students from the studio in the audience, which I'm really happy about. And ironically, the studio is entitled What If Then, um, so I should rename it as If Then. But um, we're pretty interested in, so I'm going to try to twist it around to architecture a little bit, maybe for a minute, um, since we're all architects, it's not for you all. Um, but to, to ask you, um, after your um, meta modern no sound meta meta modernism in 2010, uh, it was at a moment where you were able to uh, to kind of quote Barack Obama and the kind of uh, change speech, um, which in the subsequent years um, has turned out differently than we expected. And then I went on to read your. Um, your utopia sort of essay um, in 2015, and uh, you, you sort of start to, I think, maybe talk about utopia slightly differently in the in the in the, in the, in the, so for, in the first essay you're talking about is atopia, and then in the second one you're talking about utopia kind of, or maybe, kind of possibility, but that it's uh, kind of always receding. Does that change how you uh, talk about the islands and the admiral? Is it still the same where you went quickly to each each island, or are you going towards one island that's receding, kind of like the, the person walking who's not, you're not sure if it's going to turn out okay or not, but I thought it was really interesting that you're talking about uh, with the naivete and but hopefulness possibly re I don't know, re allowing a 
an almost utopic, but not quite, approach to, to deal with the issues, or maybe not to deal, maybe to, to not deal with the issues of today. What, what's your current thinking? Well, well, of course, we always think in time. So, inevitably, our positions slightly change, but I think overall, we are still standing only behind sort of the observations that we made 10 years ago. Uh, we use the same sort of concepts even, for instance, in the book that we published this year, but it's 10 years later. But of course, the sort of context is uh, somehow changed. Um, she also says that, okay, Obama administration, what came after his election, etc., maybe it was all a little bit different than we expected it to be, or maybe it came out the best viewpoint. But that particular moment, the enthusiasm generated by the campaign and then by his election, um, that was a specific, that is still very, very uh, crucial, I guess, to understand this notion of, uh, to understand the structure of feeling that emerges in the process. Um, of course, we also pointed there to the, the neo romantic turn in the arts, um, and what we it was a very flawed essay, uh, that's for sure, the first essay. Um, but thankfully, because that allowed a lot of other people to sort of chip in their own ideas and, and expand on it. Uh, but when we look at the, the new romantic term in the arts of the early 2000s, we indeed also missed some of the darker uh, sides of romanticism that's, and, and neo romanticism uh, that were absolutely also present during the day. Uh, so you always think in, high, in hindsight about it. Period. And, and now, when you think about the 2000s, um, in hindsight, yeah, you also see that there were these also some darker tendencies. For instance, the nationalism that is also in you know, neo romanticism. Uh, having said that, um, maybe this is some issue you might agree with or even chop um, um, yeah, my head off for. But, um, even though he speaks to completely different constituencies from the slogan Make America Great Again has the same kind of quality of um, promising a better uh, future um, and at the same time sort of a longing for uh, America that has never uh, ever been. So even though it's, they're completely opposite, they sort of Obama and Trump have sort of the same logic, namely positive the fact that things are not turning turned out, as not have not turned out as we thought they would turn out, turn out in the 90s, right? And everything seemed to be going swell, uh, promises of uh, end of uh, inflation, internal economic growth, trickle down effect, etc. Um, those promises have not materialized, quite contrary, and on in, within that situation you see is longing again, because it's basically longing, utopian longing, to go to a place that's much different than where we are today. And you see that both on the left, the political spectrum, and the right. Yeah. And it's a longing, but the fact is as well, we don't really have the, it's a desire, but we don't really have the tools or the language to, um, you see it in America great again, we don't have the tool or the language to actually conceptualize how we should get from here to that other in the future that we so desperately want for. Yeah, and I think thanks for this question. I mean, <coughs> yeah, so I, I think both both of them in very different ways are painting these pictures of an alternative with no tools, right? So, I don't know, somehow. And I think to answer your question about the islands, which is good, I would say, do you change? I mean, if we look at you know, some of the crazy people that are running governments, not just in the States, right, but in Europe, we have the same thing happening all across the board. They are, they are at once completely relativist or ironic, you might say, and completely absolutist. And then on day one, you could say, this island is absolutely the right island. And on day two, you can say, this island is absolutely the right And they can be incompatible. But no one apparently finds that a problem, right? No one says, hey, hold on a second. So there's not, not a, a sort of a coherent ideological program behind this. It's a sort of a, without the tools, it's feeling out as if it were feeling out the texture of reality to try and feel out where you could go. 
And if that doesn't work, or if you need something else, you also want to feel out this. So lower taxes, more schools. Right? <coughs> this is a silly, but yeah. So I would say there is this this shift that doesn't make them that doesn't make this utopia either less valuable or less dangerous. It's the same. Just an answer. Mm -hmm. as, as you guys are talking, I, I kept thinking, yeah. Um, so, Harry Frankfurt's uh, work um, on bullshit yeah. uh, is something that, you know, so for example, uh, would it would have been also about 10, possibly almost 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, when um, Michael Speaks, who's, who's it? I mean, um, so you guys know, but he, he um, went, went on from a uh, uh, I guess he went on from content, content, comparative literature to, into architecture, and now he's a dean of the School of Architecture. But at the time, I think, you know, he was talking about the relationship between truth and bullshit, or lying and bullshit. And I think um, at the time, it's so funny to talk about bullshit because you know uh, the idea that an architect may receive a blank piece of paper that has something to do with the site, and we would be also handed a set of programs and square footage and so square meters and so forth, and we would have to imagine something from scratch. Uh, that does not necessarily rely on any way, shape, or form of truth, but it does rely on some sort of conviction or some sort of as if. Uh, and you know, once, once the drawings are done, we submit the city, get some of this impairments, uh, it, it, it becomes legal, uh, it might even become as real as concrete. Um, and so I, I think, as you were talking about um, the, the relativisms and absolutisms, you know, things that could be real or can't be real, uh, it's suddenly the political climate makes it very difficult to um, think that bullshit is funny. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that we can. So, but bullshit is, is also a way postulating or laying down certain axiomas that can then uh, can then be used as stepping stone into a world that then sort of envelopes uh, opens itself up because you have been bullshit. Uh, I think that's what we're we're seeing in, in, in politics nowadays, but also across uh, cross culture in that sense. Uh, um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, and I think what's so important, I mean that bullshit Piece, you know, what's so important about that, but also about sort of writing. I mean, we've been working with Eric Vogelin, which is a very tricky and problematic philosopher, but also one I think with some kind of very useful ideas who emigrated uh, uh, to flee the war in the Second World War, came to the States, and he also writes about something similar to bullshit when it comes to the Nazis. And I think what he points out, what is really key, is that you know, every proposition we make, right? So if I say this or this, I'm referring and I'm requiring and implying a particular world, a particular universe. Right, so I might as well reply, uh, imply the universe that we are living in right now. I could be making up a lie or a fiction, and then I would be speaking about it or not. Right, if I said yesterday I met elves for tea, you know, I'm obviously referring to a different universe in a way, a different possible world where there are elves. And so every proposition implies its own universe. And if you lie, if you bullshit, you are creating a particular universe. But I guess also if you're an architect and you're building something, you are fitting that within a particular world that you require for this building to exist, right? And this may be this world, maybe it's seven worlds at the same time, maybe some of the stuff isn't yet developed, isn't yet possible in our world, but it's possible in the world that you are foreseeing. And I think what Vögeling did so good, it did so well in the 1950s, writing about Germany's, and so he wrote about Nazism in terms of Don Quixote. And so Vögeling says, why don't we treat Nazism like the Don Quixote myth, right? So Don Quixote believes that windmills are knights. Nice which is a re, uh, an ontological reorientation. So this is what I'm after. I think bullshit is an ontological reorientation. You see one thing and you perceive it as another, like a psychosis almost. And so Nazism, if I would right, if Don Quixote sees a windmill and says it's a knight, he is reorienting himself ontologically and creating the world to fit. But then Sancho Pancha, who is his servant, you know, who doesn't really believe it, has to go along in this, re in this reorientation because he's the servant. And so he goes along and then the nobility starts laughing and making fun. And so slowly everyone is joining in this possible world which doesn't really uh, uh, measure up to reality. And so I think it's, this bullshit is so important and I think for us it's as if the moment you postulate the fiction, you are engaging in an ontological reorientation. We, uh, the, sorry. 
you're actually being an effective in architecture, you can push what you want, but in the end, the push is being called upon by, called by legislation, yes. uh, economic uh, gravity, yes. etc. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Tim earlier, the, the choice of words are so interesting. Uh, you use the word universe. Uh, currently, you know, um, to do some hour now on um, mathematical sets, um, when you, I guess, what everything that's been from the bracket um, is a universe. I mean, that's yeah. the, like that's the, that's the lingo for describing a mathematical set universe. And every item that you introduce into the set, which should be elements, uh, once you put it in, it's real. Yeah. Um, and it can be anything. It can. It can. It can. It can be anything. It can be anything. I mean, there's a wonderful book from the early early 20th century. I don't know if anyone's read by Hans Weihinger. And so Hans Weihinger is, by all accounts, a crazy person. Uh, and by the time he finishes it, he has all kinds of, of physical problems. And he writes an introduction which is 100 pages long, celebrating himself. It's, it's a really wonderful read. He was a Kantian scholar, very famous at the time. Book was forgotten for a long time because it is a bit of a crazy book. But it's also quite interesting because he treats every single discipline as a fiction. And so he tries to trace the extent to which the economy, right, the invisible hand of Adam Smith, which, you know, he had never, no one had seen that invisible hand, obviously, no one had egoism, no one had studied that, Adam Smith made it up, right, we forget that. The idea of the rational citizen of egoism is a fiction, and so Weihinger begins to trace mathematics, architecture, the different, different fictional structures that are inherent to everything we do, and I think, that might be a beginning to really map out, right? Not just say, oh, it's a fiction, or yes, it's bullshit, or oh, yeah, that's clearly false, right? Because we all know that, right? Or we don't, but this is part of the, I think we need to begin to understand how these things are fictional, how they are bullshit. What, are, what is this ontological reorientation about? What has to be missing from this universe, right? What has to be in there? Can there be gravity? Can there not? What are the gaps? What are the leaps? In order to begin to make sense of the kind of rules that are being created. Yeah, sorry, I went off topic about this, but uh, yeah. Should we open the? Should we open this up? Uh, yeah. Should we open this up? Yes. Let's, let's <laughs> open it up. <laughs> yes. Um, Do you want this? Sure. <laughs> um, my, the question I had was asking the representation myself, but just like, how are we supposed to read the time of the band? Uh, is it a sort of periodization of the first decade of the 21st century? Or is this something that you see each of these uh, columns combining in some way now? Um, you know, just because I think also just with some of the references, and maybe this is a question related to the kind of time of theorizing a particular cultural moment also. But, you know, I mean, it seems hard to think about uh, you know, David Foster Wallace as a sort of serious contender in literature. You know, like, you know, it, like to me, that you know, David Foster Wallace is you know, you know, um, an element in like a, a starter kit meme for um, you know, sensitive public or something mm -hmm. like this. So I just sort of wonder how, like, is, is this the metamodern the moment that you see as contemporary? Or is, is it maybe something about these three categories being different frames from in which the next one can be read. But I just also, I mean, I like, to, to me it's like, um, it's, it's just, even with the, the discussion of the kind of different crises, the, the feeling I have now is that it's almost hard to name a crisis, you know, or that the, the, the kind of framework within which something like postmodernism would have been able to theorize the reason of meaning requires there to be something other than the abyss, you know, and I just, I don't know that um, nothing quite feels so solid for me at the moment, uh, enough to be able to sort of make this uh, neat kind of uh, mark of columns. Thanks for, for your question, of course, as Tim said, we only had 20 minutes, right? Um, so what we have been doing is sort of two things, playing on two playing fields simultaneously. The first one is periodizing the and periodizing the two functions. As I said, 
the crises are just a shortcut into it. And I think you're right about the sense, and it's part of the sense of that, that there's sort of a perpetual crisis, right? It's very hard to name the crisis at the moment because it's, there are crises everywhere, it seems. So, for us in the past, our period, and you can see that, for instance, when it comes to uh, the democratization of uh, computer technologies at the end of the 90s, early 2000s, which is the whole uh, sort of whole new uh, space when it comes to forces of production. You see, for instance, as well, uh, when it comes to the viability of renewable uh, technologies. Somewhere in the 2000s, there's more energy use for renewables than by nuclear. Um, so there, there, there are tons of ways to periodize this. Um, and then we play on the, 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 the playing field of the structural feeling. And for us, the structural feeling, it's not a causal relationship that it starts to emerge and then becomes dominant and that are now with it. Right? It's just that it could only become dominant within that particular context of the process. And you're absolutely right that we're also using, for instance, the data for solars. So, a structural feeling is not something that is sort of a totalizing, a clean break with everything that came before it. It's dominant, right? So it allows for all kinds of subordinate uh, residual structures of feeling, like we're still seeing modernist aesthetics sometimes, and emerging structures of feeling that are pointing towards the future. Um, and um, what you see happening is that in the 2000s, when this mental modern structural feeling becomes Dominant, you see enormous resurgence of, for instance, somebody like David Foster Wallace, who was already trying in his time to sort of fill out and uh, get beyond. It's the both aspects, not the novels. Yeah. I would say also, also the novels in the sense of that fictional irony. And, but already trying to move beyond uh, that fictional irony, for instance, in, in, in literature. And you see that the generation that becomes super popular in the violence. Egan, uh, David Smith, etc. Um, they see David Foster Wallace as a pivotal, crucial figure in this transition from a certain way of doing literature to a way of doing literature that wants to move beyond post-modern authorial strategies. So, yes, David Foster Wallace writes in the 90s, so he is sort of very early to the game, and um, he becomes absolutely super influential in. Uh, the literature of the 2000s. So that's why it's not sort of a clean cut, everything that's produced in a certain period is relevant to the period. No, the period looks to history and to the future in different ways. And there are dominant trends, but there are also trends that are maybe not so uh, clearly interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a great that answer, sure. It, that's a really good way. But I think also we should not forget, right, when Jameson begins writing, right, he's forward the present, as he, as he says. He's also aware of that it doesn't really look like a solid thing to him at that time. He wants to begin mapping it out so that we can take some form of collective action. And I think it's for us the same, but we see all these things. I think all of us feel that stuff is happening, but we feel it, which is, that's the worst. If you feel stuff is happening, and so I think it was really an attempt to try and find the vernacular, because we noticed that the vernaculars we were taught at university were no longer sufficient. And so the, the, the thing is really we're trying to find a vernacular that may help us understand some of these things and relate them to one another. And, I mean, and so the meta, uh, you know, it's, it's not a reflective stance. The meta for us came from this notion of metoxy, which Bergen and traces in Plato, which is a both neither, right? So Plato doesn't know what to do with half gods because they're ontologically unstable. So maybe that's also the flux or the, this notion. And so he says, you know what, I don't know what to do with them because they can die and they cannot die. How do I make sense? Well, they are constantly moving between. There is this concept, so they are both mortal and neither, an immortal and neither of those at the same time. So this was for us also to try and map out, and this bent, I think, is this, right? I'm sure that there is other stuff going to happen that is now emerging and it will be more dominant. Maybe we should call it fascism, I don't know what the name will be for this stuff, but I'm guessing it will be fascism. But so, it is also in flux, and I think we're very aware that we're always late and missing out. But I also think it's so key that before we take action, before we jump on to something, that we try at least to make sense of stuff in relation to another. Because the logic of the fragment is the logic also of the neoliberal, right? The logic of the fragment, of the, of the decontextualized, of the cut, that's the logic of capital. And so I think we, we should at least try 
to make sense of it, however flawed that may be. So that would be an addition my answer to it. It's a really important question, right? I mean, actually, we were talking about exactly this on our way here, that we, yeah, we don't know where to begin. Thank you. I happen to have a happy year to your book here. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm so sorry for that. you were holding the action around. This yeah, one's nice. too few of us here in the world. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm wondering, what is the role of indifference and ambivalence in your schema? And I'm asking because in architecture, at least, there, are, there are so many choices, and some architects are hesitant to even choose. There's so many items to go to. And then in ambivalence, um, although this hardware is fairly polarized right now, what what about ambivalence, not wanting to choose anything? Is there, is, is there a role in that in your scheme for ambivalence? Well, it would be my personal preference to always delay the choice to an extent. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 I think it's a generational thing for me to always be afraid of choices, right? And of people choosing one over the other. But um, in terms of... The, I think there's also this need, what we try to describe as a need that you feel that you need to choose. So, <coughs> even though you know that whatever choice you're going to make, it's going to be a shitty one, right? It's going to be fraught with all kinds of issues and problems. And you probably might have taken another choice. But it's this, this urge, whether that's out of generational desire, whether that's out of financial crisis, whether that's out of ecological crises, there is this, this need to choose in spite of better judgment in a way. Uh, because the world isn't so, you know, you have to do the shit, so you have to choose. And in terms of ambivalence, I think that's where the ambivalence lies, that you, you, you know, I don't know if it's the same, I'm guessing you know how it is here, but in Holland now, I haven't been there for a while, but you choose your insurance, right? So you choose an insurance, and I think based on how much you pay and which company you choose, you can go to certain hospitals for your disease, but not others. Right, and so if you make a choice and then you get sick and you can't go to the hospital, it's also your, it's your own fault, right? which is even worse, I guess. And I, I don't know, you're in America, so I meant it's almost worse here anyways. But, so it's, it's that the ambivalence is there always already, it's always already there. I would say in the 90s and 80s, you linger in that moment of ambivalence, right? Because irony speaks with two tongues, right? In Dutch, right? So you speak both with the tongue that you're saying, and you speak as it were with an invisible tongue, which is saying, none of what I'm saying I believe in. But that is only understood if the reader or the listener knows you. Because if I would say, I love, uh, I love uh, Gilmer Girls, you don't know, you don't, because you don't know me. I do love Gilmer Girls, it's a safe statement. <laughs> I do the best things to come out of the US. And so, I mean that, serious. I mean, this is left, but I mean that. But you wouldn't know that because, you know. I know that because I know you. <laughs> yes. Right. I don't know, that. maybe you have a better answer. I don't know. You started well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the, the ambivalence is always there, but it depends on the sort of context in which this ambivalence is sort of uh, spinning itself out. So you could be very ambivalent about all kinds of things in the 80s and 90s. That was fine. It's fine. You could be ambivalent about whether I should vote for this politician or not. Because it didn't really matter, and maybe there was no necessity to choose. But in this historical context, with this sensible man, this notion that things are rapidly changing, and not for the, not for the good, uh, uh, you might still be ambivalent about other things, but you're always forced into a certain position. That ambivalence might stay with you, but still, yeah, you already chose one. Their side of your uh, name spots that you have about soon. Yeah, I have a better one. There's this Alison Gibbons who co edited the book with us, so it's amazing. And she wrote this really good article about Adam Thurwald, the writer. I don't know if you know Adam Thurwald, is a novelist from the UK. And he has this wonderful sort of stylistic trope in which he will say, Whilst I was in London, and then you're expecting for the other side for something else to come, and he will stop. And so he does that constantly. So you're always aware that reality is more complex and more multiplicitous than the one that you're experiencing, 
But as a reader, you're never privy to that, so you're always sort of cut out. So you are aware of the ambivalence and, in this case, simultaneity, but you can't access it uh, the way you, you might want to. Uh, just in this question, which I think is a super interesting and important one. Uh, so uh, in architecture, uh, there's a this rap battle forum called Log. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, within it, I, I don't know if you're referring to that uh, as well. So within it, uh, the word of difference is currently uh, a debated topic. Um, and the, the, I guess the individual who's kind of behind the, the stance of indifference I wonder, you know, I wonder about his position as well, because you know, like, on the one hand, I would say, is this Sprezzatura, or you know, the art of effortlessness? So he needs to, I guess, construct an image of effortlessness, and therefore he has to behave in a different way. So that's maybe one way for me to understand the motivation. I guess the other would be from the stance of Stoicism, which is, you know, I have to consume everything. I have to listen to everything uh, before making a proper decision and therefore everything is valuable. Uh, and when everything is valuable, uh, nothing can possibly be uh, the most important. Uh, and so, I, you know, we, anyway, that's, and I wonder what you're going to say about that as well. Okay, now going on a uh, very slippery slope, because we're going to commit ourselves to venture a little bit into your domain, if that's all right. And I probably made a mistake. So it's just oh, speculation. Okay. <laughs> just speculation. It, it, it is indifference, right? Uh, is that uh, to say sort of uh, I don't care or can be either this or that and it's all fine by me? Is that sort of the, the attitude that's sort of the anything goes attitude basically? Here you have whatever works. Yeah, uh, I have a feeling that this anything goes is not any longer uh, the dominant trope um, across culture, but maybe also in, in, in architecture. Um, so there's still the freedom, and maybe even more freedom, to design all kinds of uh, forms and services. Uh, but you always need to somehow uh, need, uh, want to make some kind of difference here. Uh, so there's a, lo a lot of uh, freedom to choose whatever you want, but it's also always tied to something very uh, pragmatic and uh, uh, practical. And that is, for instance, the need to build more in a more sustainable way, right? So you're still able to, maybe even more so than before because of all the, the computer uh, modeling, to create very spectacular flavor forms, but you're also now required to tie to the functionality of being uh, more sustainable, of catching uh, sunlight and services, or of uh, making sure that uh, the wind can, can sort of power your buildings. So I can't see how you can still be indifferent in the sense of anything goes, I don't care, in the light of all the problems and also all the new regulations and also all the new needs uh, and the, the, the new uh, uh, needs of urban planning, for instance, that are now uh, coming very clear. How in that context you can still be indifferent and you are sort of required either by yourself, or by some kind of generation of force, or by simple legislation, to make some kind of difference. So I think this is sort of catching with the shift from anything goes to whatever works, given the uh, specific needs of this particular day and age, and uh, considering um, um, your, your own agenda here. Um, so this is just pure speculation. I think this sort of captures uh, um, something like you are English, you might, you probably don't like it, but I'm not saying it because I like his work or something. But you see there a big shift from sort of anything goes playful formalism to, again, enormous playful formalism, but always tied to something that needs to actually be done. Right? Why do you think uh, we don't like your opinions? I don't do. <laughs> <laughs> I have been just saying we're not, we're not celebrating or, 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 or something, we're analyzing. And you see that particular shift perfectly clear, clearly illustrated in his, in his work. Um, so yeah. I haven't answered the question, why do you think no one here likes Bjarke Ingels? <laughs> no, because there's a tendency you want. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's always a tendency that the more successful you become in the hate it. You see it in the arts, people hate Elias uh, for instance, which is completely unfair because he's a great artist. So. That's why 
als Ministerium. Äh, Is this it? Is this it? Is it? Everybody stop. Yes, this could be it. Let's finish it there. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, um, thank you everyone for being here. And thank you guys for... Man, could, could I ask one? I mean, you're, you're, so you're all students, right? You're all yeah. students of, of these, I imagine, or staff. I didn't see this. I mean, I guess in a way we're speaking about you, which is, you know, very dangerous given that you're sitting here. I mean, I guess just really interested in that. Like, my question about periodization was more like, do you see this as something which stops with 2010 or something like that? Like, do you see this as the moment that we're in now, or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You? yeah. Okay. Still, yeah. Hmm. I think the most wrong is this, I mean, right? Like, yeah, but wait, is that a moment? I think Donald Trump is a symptom, sadly enough. You know, this is not a Warhol story, right? We're not celebrating this stuff. I think Trump and the populist movement we see all over Europe, now. even in Norway, where I live, right, which is the wealthiest country alive, there is also populism on the rise. Yeah. I think these are symptoms of the same thing, sadly, that some of these movements I would celebrate were symptoms of. Yeah. I mean, I guess I was, I was just curious about it, because things like, I don't know, the new sincerity, it just, or, I don't know, like, when I was, like in the 2000s, maybe we bought organic food and was just going to hell. And uh, then, you know, but just like things like that now, it just feels like, um, I don't know, the, the kind of hopefulness yeah, yeah. of that moment. Uh, I'll buy whatever, you know, like the, the sort of hope for some kind of uh, self correction from within the system seems like it's no longer really there. Like, look at the plan over. Look, when someone yeah. says, makes a tiny mistake in a, in a speech, or when I would now say, uh, I don't know, I, I, I would say something horrible. Right? So Timothy Morton, just uh, in philosophy, in philosophers have these little things where he made a, a, an unfortunate tweet about Mark Fisher, who was, was a great thinker. Uh, and then everyone, just everyone started correcting. And I don't think this sort of moral righteousness would have existed, for better or worse, right? I'm not putting value judgment on it. In the 90s, I don't think, so I think in terms of correcting, I think it is there, but it has taken far less pleasant tones. At the same time, I think there's a lot happening, especially in the States right now, which makes me incredibly hopeful. Me too, yeah. Yes. Right? I think that makes me so hopeful uh, for changes. I think what is, what, is, what is key, what is potentially amazing and potentially terrifying is that we don't really seem to have the tools to construct these alternatives, right? This is what Margaret Edward, I think, pointed out so wonderfully. Now, we spoke about this in this article that people that started hating her for, as, as happens these days, I guess, where she said, look, I'm, you know, so we, we have accepted that maybe the law doesn't work, maybe the, this, this system of, of how we understand reality doesn't work. Well, I'm wondering what the next system is and who is, who is in power in that system, which seems a really relevant question. But so I do think we're in the midst of this. It's, at the moment, it's not only taking sort of these light-hearted, new sincerity, quirky, right? I think these are at the start of it, but they are also phenomena that evaporate again. In literature, we see different things happening right now. I mean, we, I think we had folk, right? We see so many different things happening right now in music. So these are just symptoms in the same way that when Jameson writes about postmodernism, or, you know, he writes about stuff that happens for five years, but then he says, well, there's something else happening here, there's something else happening here. So these things move. I would say the structure of feeling that runs through them is in this case the same. It will dissipate and it will become less important. But right now I would definitely say, and now I feel good silly, but yeah, I would say it's the same. Sorry, I don't... No, no, yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying, I'm trying to kind of parse the categories, like pop music, I don't know, it's probably like... Yeah, we're at like the end of the second decade of the 21st century, it's like, yeah. I don't know what the story is, like SoundCloud rappers or something. Completely different. Uh, it just yeah. seems like a very different cultural moment. And I just wonder whether you can, um, whether whether the the broader theoretical categories that these examples, because of course they're examples, and so they have their limitations in that way. And, um, but whether whether the, the categories 
to which they are intended to speak uh, still obtain, or whether there is a, a different set of categories? Yeah, I think we should see them as sort of the first symptoms of the changing structure of the like the very first sort of uh, signpost that something was a little bit off, that we're not so sure anymore whether we were actually at the end or what to be at the end, right? We're speaking that some, something was up, basically. So, um, in folk music, which is now, uh, there was very strong revival in the early 2000s, and one of the key things they said was, look, we are reacting to uh, Right? In a cynical worldview, what we want to do is create, while we know maybe it's impossible, new uh, universes, new communities. If we want to be part of the earnest again, um, that's just the first symptom. Now you see the, 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 yeah, the, the, the same sentiment, the same sensitivity, all kinds of other uh, phenomena popping up. Um, but they also come to the same sort of notion of hey, things are changing. I don't like what I'm seeing. Um, something will is hidden around the bend, and that will definitely be uh, a very bad place that we're in. And something needs to be done now. We don't know how. Something needs to be done. So I read those are very old examples. But for us, it's sort of archaeological <coughs> records of that first initial phase of transition. It's a bit harder, right? I think, especially now that uh, the, the consequences of environmental ruin becoming clearer and clearer to us. I mean, you know, we're from Holland. I'm guessing there's one other Dutch person here. I don't know how long Holland will still be there, right? I think we're one of the first to go away once the sea levels are rising. So I think, you know, I think it's, especially for me, I can't speak to Rogan, 2008, I think is really when the lines harden, right? Because I, naively, had the hope that the financial crisis would, and I think this is what you see in the first article, I had the hope that this would necessitate a restructuring of the financial system. And what happened instead is that everything just got to worse, right? These the lines were deepened. <coughs> so like, you see a lot of, of, of responses to that and on the different sides of the political spectrum, right? Of a situation that hasn't changed when I think many of us had the hope it would change to some extent. Mm -hmm. I don't know, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesse, uh, I've got a question. Uh, but thanks, that's good. I followed in the advance because I arrived 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago, so I missed everybody's talks. <laughs> <laughs> but seeing the chart and knowing a little bit of what time they met like in the last fall about the conception of this discussion and specifically to the kind of chart that's on the screen, one thing that really strikes me is that the uh, it, in the postmodernism column, there's an ingrained politics to all those categories. Um, and I apologize about if I'm repeating anybody's uh, statements from earlier, but in the metamodernism one, there, uh, there's an almost apolitical capacity in both. Like, they can cut both ways, right? Like, new sincerity can be sincere in any persuasion of what people think they think is true. Um, there was an article a few months ago about how the word alt that meant something in the 90s now means the complete opposite of yeah. today. Right? Like grunge and alt rock now has turned into alt right. Um, and so the work you know, alt cuts both ways now. Um, and so, from what I've gathered a little bit, like we, we don't necessarily have the conceptual framework to make sense of this. And I, I, I kind of like the word meta modernism because I think there's, in everything in that column, there's a meta aspect to it that kind of needs an um, but I wonder maybe like how like people of the older generation, I think I've heard over and over and over saying as a critique like, yeah, but what do you stand for? Yeah. Right. So, like, so you have just the That's a good question. Yeah, I think yeah. yeah. And so uh, as if they're like everything is just an action without a uh, without like, kind of empty gesture. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder if maybe those things on the on the right. Yeah, these are all aesthetic forms, and so there is a politics to quirky films may look not political, um, but their politics is, for instance, that they have the trope of childlike identity, in which you sort of uh, create very clean frames, in which you sort of put aside all the clutter, chaos, and disorder 
of the world and just focus on the square meter that you can sort of manage and try to sort of engage humanely, effectively, sincerely, constructively on that square meter. So the politics is very local in that sense, right? It would be a political interpretation of the, the, the trope of childlike identity. I'm not saying that it's good or bad, I'm saying that it's good and bad. Everything that we see across culture is hyper problematic in the light of what actually needs to be done to avert some kind of catastrophe. So I don't agree that these are apolitical forms of gesture. Every aesthetics has its politics. This is the politics of creative films. Focus on your own square circle. Make sure that the clutter of the world don't, don't come in and try to do as much as you can on that, on that square meter. I would say, for instance. Yeah, I would also think that these are, these are highly political, but they're political in, in two, two different sense. I think the first category for us would be concerned with the politics of the inside. Right? So what's inside, what's there now, and you are taking it apart and you're showing the carcass of a rotting society. And I think the second would be concerned with from scratch, with no tools at hand, imagining an alternative. And that's the imagination of an alternative, especially after decades of exhaustion, is incredibly political. Right? Even sadly, if terrible people are doing it, it's a very political act. And I think also, in terms of not taking a stand, what we discussed this a bit, so I think it's, yeah, it's difficult. No, no, so it's, I'm happy to bring it back. It's about the difficulty of taking a stand because you know that so many points are valuable. Right, so you you're not certain where you should where you should take place and what you should leave behind as a result. Right, you're aware of the consequences that your actions may have. Um, the same thing. I mean, this is my honest answer, right? So it's not a popular answer, but it also comes back to your question. I think my honest answer is that these are all bourgeois forms, heightened bourgeois forms, right? And I think what we see now, what we call the hardening, is that this is spreading across class lines, right? So we come from a Marxist tradition, so we think class is everything. Right, uh, I think it's fair to say. We think lots of the strata uh, across everything, and so I think this is so safe because it's bourgeois. I mean, quality TV, right? Quality TV is literally television's attempt to be not just entertainment but art. And in order to do so, they use the exact same means um, that uh, Antonioni does in filmmaking in the 60s and 70s, or that uh, photographers do in the 20s, or that Flaubert does when he invents the novel. Right, they have the exact same um, stylistic tropes of democratization, creating larger fictional worlds in which not every god, right, like in Chekhov, has to go off. So these are completely bourgeois, urbanite discussions. And I think, um, in, in the, they, so there's a soft politics, I would say, a politics that almost wishes to hide itself, I, I guess. But I would say that what we've seen since is, a, you know, when it, it's dealt with across class lines, and I mean lower, although I guess you could say on the top end, the 1% is also defending itself more rigorously and rigorously as well. And so, uh, since you're mostly looking at art, and um, they're mostly architects, um, what's, is there, I see in the essays a kind of um, productive possibility of actually um, staying in your square meter, going into that square meter and playing out a possible future or near future and then presenting it to all the other islands around as a kind of, as a productive possibility you know, because we all produce yeah. and so instead of just, you know, finding no ground to kind of stand on a way forward is to actually kind of stay or to look at that square meter as a kind of test and at least put it out there. Yeah, and like you're feeling it out, right? We were talking about this yesterday as well. Sorry. It's like a feeling out, right? So if the, the, one of the famous models for the postmodernist or guess is map that covers the territory, right? So you have this map that covers everything. And I think if you're feeling out on that square meter, you're lifting, you're lifting a bit of that map off and maybe it will stay, and maybe it will collapse again. I think you're, literally, I think you're feeling, which also shows that we have little else we've got left in a way, you're feeling out what happens if, and of course, you may lift something, and you may create a hole in the ground whilst doing it, lifting up some gravel. But so it's this feeling out, and I mean, I guess many of the problems that come with this feeling out, have you seen the square, the, the film? 
No. So I recommend it. It's, I mean, it's hilarious. The film is just wonderful, I think. But also, because it's about a square mm -hmm. in which people have to care for each other. Mm -hmm. And of course, the entire project fails miserably. But so it's, yeah, I would say, I agree 100%. I was going to say something about uh, in relation to Jesse's question and your response. Um, I, from from this interaction, I'm, I'm thinking about the aesthetics of the of this uh, category, which is postmodernism or and the metamodernism category, and the, the correlation that I'm thinking about now is a, a hard a hard aesthetics and a mild aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, 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 but then you know, the hard and the mild is independent of of left or right or uh, class lines or so forth. Uh, rather, I think it constructs a very different uh, pendulum. You know, the, the people who are very mild versus the people who are very yeah. Hard. You know, it goes like this. I think you know, like a stretching of the elastic. That's right. And I, I'm also thinking about within architecture. I mean, just talking about within architecture, uh, the aesthetics of let's say Leon Leon or Free um, uh, Africa. You know, I'm just thinking about. Uh, a, a mild-ish approach, uh, where in case you DBS, I think there's a kind of like very nuanced way of approaching architecture from a certain generation that matches your description, um, and a, a kind of like super hardcore way of looking at life, like let's say KM3, for instance, uh, which is like a, a super kind of like iron fist, quantitative, uh, absolute, uh, something, something rather, uh, which is hard, really hard. And, and I feel like that generation led to, a, 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 let's say, hyper-rationalism within architecture, mm -hmm. where uh, a kind of programmatic, quantitative shifting of boxes would result in form, whereas uh, the generation that I've been describing, in which, let's say, the KGDBS group, it's not that, it's, it's something else. It's mild. And people prefer to be mild these days. I mean, even the way that people are dressed right now are very mild these days. I mean, even the way that people are dressed right now are very mild. Versus, if I were to be sitting here in the early 2000s, I might I might expect hot pink or I don't know something else. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, that's yeah we just talked in the essay about the the, the from the uh, modernism to do with or I'm probably misremembering, but the kind of qualitative to the uh, the quantitative to the qualitative. In the, no, no time. Oh dear, I, I, we may as well. It's been a while, and I try never to look at that essay again. So uh, it's, it's no, may, you may be right. A qualitative transformation. Yeah, it's a transformation to qualitative from quantitative. Yeah, it's the law of dynamics. <laughs> yeah, that's the. Uh, that was said for so many things in life. No, no, it's. it's so the, the tipping point, so when uh, it's additional another quantity, or one unit more, so sort of then transforms the whole sort of culture, that's sort of the way to describe. But you see all these little things emerging everywhere and nowhere, and then all of a sudden, somewhere in the 2000s, it transforms into a quality transformation in culture. I think that was what it was. Something that's that it just made to sort of end. We talk about it from a cultural and artistic perspective. When you talk about the shift from irony to post-irony from a little economic perspective, and that is what Nico Santino does in, in, in the book, it's a super great argument. Um, you see that post-irony is actually the desired mode of behavior for the Googleplex, right? Because irony is your defense mechanism in the, uh, the, the cubicle office where you have to work from 9 to 5 co workers that you might hate, which is paper that's really boring. So, irony, like in the documentary the office, becomes your defense mechanism against a cruel world, right? But if you're going to be an ironic bastard in a Google Play, so you put every project team where you have to come up with something creative, people come and puke uh, on you, and nothing productive will come of it, right? So, you also have to be sort of Post ironic in that particular project team in which you have three months to write a pitch for some kind of something, right? So, and if, if you look at the Google Blacks, I mean, yeah, it's almost like an Olympic village made a picture of Disneyland. I mean, it's completely weird, but it, it's one thing, it's not ironic. 
it's really a supposed ironic sort of mode, it becomes highly productive for today's <coughs> well, right? Um, so again, to argue that you see the shift from irony to post irony in a lot of different contexts, and in all these different contexts there are pros and cons, but I think ultimately they're also sort of still very uh, problematic, or at least that is our task to problematize. Why are we uh, uh, not super engaged, for instance? Uh, it's, I think that's a valid question in these times. Um, so, uh, I mean, sorry, I mean, I think we're just sorry. Okay, um, just because of because of my kind of current knowledge of your uh, apparent hatred for Tony Blair, um, <laughs> and I'm just kind of also trying to complete this line. If Tony Blair represents the end of the spectrum uh, that that you uh, must resist, and uh, there's a kind of somewhere in the middle, which is um, mildish. Like I guess. Once you get to Tony to Blair, it's so mild that it's Lenin. Um, but once you get yeah. Tony Blair stands for a certain type of politics that is typical for the postmodern economy. It can be centrist, liberal, neoliberal, multicultural consensus. The third way, where you sort of, where the left and the right are shaking hands, and it could be because the economy was booming, why would you want to be uh, left or whatever? That's a, it's the third way of Schroeder, or Blair, or Pocahontas, or Prime Minister, etc. Um, that stands for that particular end of history moment. What we have been seeing, and I already wrote that directly after the, the crisis, even before Occupy and Tea Party, um, what we inevitably will see and have been seeing throughout uh, the, the, the last modern years is that the center cannot hold. You see complete polarization and fragmentation of the political landscape, um, in which you only have very uh, small majorities or very large minorities. That cover. Right? You see, all of a sudden, all across Europe, you see all kinds of coalition governments in countries where you used to have just one party ruling, for instance, right? You also see all kinds of uh, small fragmentary parties on the fringes of the political spectrum popping up, or you mean, all of a sudden getting a lot of votes. So it's not so much that I hate Tony Blair, it's that I hate sort of the kind of politics that he stands for, but for, when I'm not personal at all. It's just simply the, the, the politics that defines the postmodern years in, in hindsight. Um, and now there's a completely other form of politics, which is the politics of uh, fringe parties, of unstable uh, governments, of uh, uh, relatively volatile political situations. You get Trump Obama, you know, how volatile they want to have it. Gary Wilders, for instance. Okay, Gary Wilders, who is the, the, the number two in Holland. Uh, uh, but also uh, uh, Corbyn and his uh, old school socialism. Young people all of a sudden think, hey, what the fuck, social democracy, never heard of it. Sounds great. So all of a sudden, this guy who's saying the same thing since the, the, the 70s becomes super popular. He has been repeating himself for 45, 50 years. The same as maybe even for Sanders, right? Um, so yeah, um, um, I obviously am triggered by <laughs> the name Tony Blair. But that's because, yeah, it, it is so typical. It's, it's the reflection of this. Uh, central balance and this, this, this notion of oscillation mm -hmm. that's been translated into the political arena. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the end of the alternative, right? Tina for Thatcher, third way for Blair. It's the same, same thing. Clinton here, and Cork, Schroeder. And now, I mean, the politics of compromise versus the politics of exchange, in which you throw shit at each other from your own trench, and then together that makes a really unstable, uneven. <laughs> Well, it seems like we can chat forever. <laughs> Everyone was sleeping. <laughs> no, <it is>. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks for the Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.